Recording by Alan Chant. Sailing Alone Around the World by Joshua Slocum. Chapter 5. Consisting of Sailing from Gibraltar with the assistance of Her Majesty's Tug. The spray's course changed from the Suez Canal to Cape Horn. Chased by a Moorish pirate. A comparison with Columbus. The Canary Islands. The Cape Verde Islands. Sea life. Arrival at Pernambuco. A bill against the Brazilian government. Preparing for the stormy weather of the Cape. Monday, August 25. The spray sailed from Gibraltar, well repaid for whatever deviation she had made from a direct course to reach the place. A tug belonging to Her Majesty towed the sloop into the steady breeze clear of the mount, where her sails caught a volant wind, which carried her once more to the Atlantic, where it rose rapidly to a furious gale. My plan was, in going down this coast, to haul off shore well clear of the land, which hereabouts is the home of pirates. But I had hardly accomplished this when I perceived a felucha making out of the nearest port, and finally following in the wake of the spray. Now my course to Gibraltar had been taken with a view to proceed up the Mediterranean Sea, through the Suez Canal, down the Red Sea and east about, instead of a western route which I finally adopted. By officers of vast experience in navigating these seas, I was influenced to make the change. Longshore pirates on both coasts being numerous, I could not afford to make light of the advice. But here I was, after all, evidently in the midst of pirates and thieves. I changed my course. The Felucha did the same, both vessels sailing very fast, but the distance growing less and less between us. The spray was doing nobly. She was even more than at her best, but in spite of all I could do, she would broach now and then. She was carrying too much sail for safety. I must reef, or be dismasted and lose all, pirate or no pirate. I must reef, even if I had to grapple with him for my life. I was not long in reefing the mainsail, and sweating it up, probably not more than fifteen minutes. But the felucha had in the meantime so shortened the distance between us, that I now saw the tuft of hair on the heads of the crew, by which, it is said, Mohammed will pull the villains up to heaven. And they were coming on like the wind. From what I could clearly make out now, I felt them to be the sons of generations of pirates, and I saw by their movements that they were now preparing to strike a blow. The exultation on their faces, however, was changed in an instant to a look of fear and rage. Their craft, with too much sail on, broached too on the crest of a great wave. This one great sea changed the aspect of affairs suddenly as the flash of a gun. Three minutes later the same wave overtook the spray, and shook her in every timber. At the same moment the sheet strop parted, and away went the main boom, broken short at the rigging. Impulsively I sprang to the jib halyards and downhaul, and instantly downed the jib. The headsail being off, and the helm put hard down, the sloop came in the wind with a bound. While shivering there, but a moment though it was, I got the mainsail down and secured inboard, broken boom and all. How I got the boom in before the sail was torn I hardly know, but not a stitch of it was broken. The mainsail being secured, I hoisted away the jib and, without looking round, stepped quickly to the cabin and snatched down my loaded rifle and cartridges at hand, for I made mental calculations that the pirate would by this time have recovered his course and be close aboard, and that when I saw him it would be better for me to be looking at him along the barrel of a gun. The piece was at my shoulder when I peered into the mist. 
but there was no pirate within a mile. The wave and squall that carried away my boom dismasted the felucha outright. I perceived his thieving crew, some dozen or more of them, struggling to recover their rigging from the sea. Allah blacken their faces. I sailed comfortably on under the jib and forestay sail, which I now set. I fished the boom and furled the sail snug for the night, then hauled the sloop's head two points offshore to allow for the set of current and heavy rollers towards the land. This gave me the wind three points on the starboard quarter and a steady pull in the headsails. By the time I had things in this order it was dark, and a flying fish had already fallen on deck. I took him below for my supper, and found myself too tired to cook or even to eat a thing already prepared. I do not remember to have been more tired before, or since, in all my life than I was at the finish of that day. Too fatigued to sleep, I rolled about with the motion of the vessel until near midnight, when I made shift to dress my fish and prepare a dish of tea. I fully realise now, if I had not before, that the voyage ahead would call for exertions ardent and lasting. On August 27 nothing could be seen of the moor, or his country either, except two peaks, away in the east through the clear atmosphere of morning. Soon after the sun rose, even these were obscured by haze, much to my satisfaction. The wind, for a few days following my escape from the pirates, blew a steady but moderate gale, and the sea, though agitated into long rollers, was not uncomfortably rough or dangerous, and while sitting in my cabin I could hardly realise that any sea was running at all. So easy was the long, swinging motion of the sloop over the waves. All distracting uneasiness and excitement being now over, I was once more alone with myself in the realisation that I was on the mighty sea and in the hands of the elements. But I was happy, and was becoming more and more interested in the voyage. Columbus, in the Santa Maria, sailing these seas more than four hundred years before, was not so happy as I, nor so sure of success in what he had undertaken. His first troubles at sea had already begun. His crew had managed, by foul play or otherwise, to break the ship's rudder while running before probably just such a gale as the spray had passed through. And there was dissension on the Santa Maria— something that was unknown on the spray. After three days of squalls and shifting winds, I threw myself down to rest and sleep, while, with helm lashed, the sloop sailed steadily on her course. September 1, in the early morning, land clouds rising ahead told of the Canary Islands not far away. A change in the weather came next day, Storm clouds stretched their arms across the sky. From the east, to all appearances, might come a fierce harmattan, or from the south might come the fierce hurricane. Every point of the compass threatened a wild storm. My attention was turned to reefing sails, and no time was to be lost over it either, for the sea in a moment was confusion itself and I was glad to head the sloop three points or more away from her true course, that she might ride safely over the waves. I was now scudding her for the channel between Africa and the island of Fuerteventura, the easternmost of the Canary Islands, for which I was on the lookout. At 2 p.m., the weather becoming suddenly fine, the island stood in view, already abeam to starboard, and not more than seven miles off. Fuerteventura is twenty-seven hundred feet high, and in fine weather is visible many leagues away. The wind freshened in the night, and the spray had a fine run through the channel. By daylight September 3 she was twenty-five miles clear of all the islands, 
when a calm ensued, which was the precursor of another gale of wind that soon came on, bringing with it dust from the African shore. It howled dismally while it lasted, and though it was not the season of the Harmattan, the sea in the course of an hour was discoloured with a reddish-brown dust. The air remained thick with flying dust all the afternoon, but the wind, veering northwest at night, swept it back to land and afforded the spray once more a clear sky. Her mast now bent under a strong, steady pressure, and her bellying sail swept the sea as she rolled scuppers under, curtsying to the waves. These rolling waves thrilled me, as they tossed my ship, passing quickly under her keel. This was grand sailing. September 4, the wind still blew, fresh from the north-northeast, and the sea surged along with the sloop. About noon, a steamship, a bullock droger, from the river plate hove in sight, steering northeast and making bad weather of it. I signalled her, but got no answer. She was plunging into the head sea and rolling in a most astonishing manner, and from the way she yawed one might have said that a wild steer was at the helm. On the morning of September 6, I found three flying fish on deck, and a fourth one down the fore-scuttle as close as possible to the frying-pan. It was the best haul yet, and afforded me a sumptuous breakfast and dinner. The spray had now settled down to the trade winds and to the business of her voyage. Later in the day another droger hove in sight, rolling as badly as her predecessor. I threw out no flag to this one, but got the worst of it for passing under her lee. She was indeed a stale one, and the poor cattle, how they bellowed! The time was when ships passing one another at sea backed their topsails and had a gam, and on parting fired guns. But those good old days have gone. People have hardly time nowadays to speak even on the broad ocean where news is news, and as for a salute of guns, they cannot afford the powder. There are no poetry-enshrined freighters on the sea now. It is a prosy life where we have no time to bid one another good morning. My ship, running now in the full swing of the trades, left me days to myself for rest and recuperation. I employed the time in reading and writing, or in whatever I found to do among the rigging and the sails to keep them all in order. The cooking was always done quickly, and was a small matter, as the bill of fare consisted mostly of flying fish, hot biscuits and butter, potatoes, coffee and cream, dishes readily prepared. On September 10 the spray passed the island of St. Antonio, the northwesternmost of the Cape Verdes, close aboard. The landfall was wonderfully true, considering that no observations for longitude had been made. The wind northeast, as the sloop drew by the island, was very squally, but I reefed her sails snug, and steered broad from the island of blustering St. Antonio. Then, leaving the Cape Verde Islands out of sight astern, I found myself once more sailing a lonely sea, and in a solitude supreme all around. When I slept, I dreamed that I was alone. This feeling never left me, but sleeping or waking, I seemed always to know the position of the sloop, and I saw my vessel moving across the chart, which became a picture before me. One night, while I sat in the cabin under this spell, the profound stillness all about was broken by human voices alongside. I sprang instantly to the deck, startled beyond my power to tell. Passing close under lee like an apparition was a white bark under full sail. The sailors on board of her were hauling on ropes to brace the yards, which just cleared the sloop's mast as she swept by. No one hailed from the white-winged flyer, 
but I saw someone on board say that he saw lights on the sloop, and that he made her out to be a fisherman. I sat long on the starlit deck that night, thinking of ships, and watching the constellations on their voyage. On the following day, September 13, a large four-masted ship passed some distance to windward, heading north. The sloop was now rapidly drawing towards the region of doldrums, and the force of the trade winds was lessening. I could see by the ripples that a counter-current had set in. This I estimated to be about sixteen miles a day. In the heart of the counter-stream the rate was more than that setting eastward. September 14 a lofty masted ship heading north was seen from the masthead. Neither this ship nor the one yesterday was within signal distance, yet it was good even to see them. On the following day heavy rain clouds rose in the south, obscuring the sun. This was ominous of doldrums. On the 16th the spray entered this gloomy region to battle with squalls and to be harassed by fitful calms, for this is the state of the elements between the northeast and the southeast trades, where each wind struggling in turn for mastery expends its force whirling about in all directions. Making this still more trying to one's nerve and patience, the sea was tossed into confused cross-lumps and fretted by eddying currents. As if something more were needed to complete a sailor's discomfort in this state, the rain poured down in torrents day and night. The spray struggled and tossed for ten days, making only three hundred miles on her course in all that time. I didn't say anything. On September 23, the fine schooner Nantasket of Boston from Bear River for the River Plate, lumber-laden and just through the doldrums, came up with the spray, and her captain passing a few words she sailed on. Being much fouled on the bottom by shellfish, she drew along with her fishes which had been following the spray, which was less provided with that sort of food. Fishes will always follow a foul ship. A barnacle-grown log adrift has the same attraction for deep-sea fishes. One of this little school of deserters was a dolphin that had followed the spray about a thousand miles, and had been content to eat scraps of food thrown overboard from my table, for, having been wounded, it could not dart through the sea to prey on other fishes. I had become accustomed to seeing the dolphin which I knew by its scars, and missed it whenever it took occasional excursions away from the sloop. One day, after it had been off some hours, it returned in company with three yellow tails, a sort of cousin to the dolphin. This little school kept together, except when in danger and when foraging about the sea. Their lives were often threatened by hungry sharks that came round the vessel, and more than once they had narrow escapes. Their mode of escape interested me greatly, and I passed hours watching them. They would dart away, each in a different direction, so that the wolf of the sea, the shark pursuing one, would be led away from the others, and after a while they would all return and rendezvous under one side or other of the sloop. Twice their pursuers were diverted by a tin pan, which I towed astern of the sloop, and which was mistaken for a bright fish, and while turning in their peculiar way that sharks have when about to devour their prey, I shot them through the head. Their precarious life seemed to concern the yellow tails very little, if at all. All living things without doubt are afraid of death, Nevertheless, some of the species I saw huddled together, as though they knew they were created for the larger fishes, and wished to give the least possible trouble to their captors. I have seen, on the other hand, whales swimming in a circle around a school of herrings, and with mighty exertion bunching them together in a whirlpool set in motion by their flukes. And when the small fry were all whirled nicely together, 
one or the other of the leviathans, lunging through the centre with open jaws, take in a boatload or so at a single mouthful. Off the Cape of Good Hope, I saw schools of sardines or other small fish being treated in this way by great numbers of cavalry fish. There was not the slightest chance of escape for the sardines, while the cavalry circled round and round, feeding from the edge of the mass. It was interesting to note how rapidly the small fry disappeared, and though it was repeated before my eyes over and over, I could hardly perceive the capture of a single sardine, so dexterously was it done. Along the equatorial limit of the southeast trade winds, the air was heavily charged with electricity, and there was much thunder and lightning. It was hereabout I remembered that, a few years before, the American ship Alert was destroyed by lightning. Her people, by wonderful good fortune, were rescued on the same day and brought to Pernambuco, where I then met them. On September 25, in the latitude of 5 degrees north, longitude 26 degrees 30 minutes west, I spoke the ship North Star of London. The great ship was out 48 days from Norfolk, Virginia, and was bound for Rio, where we met again about two months later. The spray was now 30 days from Gibraltar. The spray's next companion of the voyage was a swordfish, that swam alongside, showing its tail fin out of the water, till I made a stir for my harpoon, when it hauled its black flag down and disappeared. September 30, at half-past eleven in the morning, the spray crossed the equator in longitude 29 degrees 30 minutes west. At noon she was two miles south of the line, the southeast trade winds met rather light in about four degrees north, gave her sails now a stiff, full breeze, sending her handsomely over the sea towards the coast of Brazil, where, on October 5, just north of Olinda Point, without further incident she made the land, casting anchor in Pernambuco Harbour about noon, forty days from Gibraltar, and all well on board. Did I tire of the voyage in all that time? Not a bit of it. I was never in better trim in all my life, and was eager for the more perilous experience of rounding the horn. It was not at all strange in a life common to sailors that, having already crossed the Atlantic twice, and being now half-way from Boston to the Horn, I should find myself still among friends. My determination to sail westward from Gibraltar not only enabled me to escape the pirates of the Red Sea, but in bringing me to Pernambuco landed me on familiar shores. I had made many voyages to this and other ports in Brazil. In 1893 I was employed as master to take the famous Ericsson ship Destroyer from New York to Brazil to go against the rebel Mello and his party. The destroyer, by the way, carried a submarine cannon of enormous length. In the same expedition went the Nictheroy, the ship purchased by the United States government during the Spanish War and renamed the Buffalo. The destroyer was in many ways the better ship of the two, but the Brazilians in their curious war sank her themselves at Bahia. With her sank my hope of recovering wages due me. Still, I could but try to recover, for to me it meant a great deal. But now within two years the whirly gig of time had brought the mellow party into power, and although it was the legal government which had employed me, the so-called rebels felt under less obligation to me than I could have wished. During these visits to Brazil... I had made the acquaintance of Dr. Pereira, owner and editor of El Comercio Journal, and soon after the spray was safely moored in Upper Topsail Reach, the doctor, who is a very enthusiastic yachtsman, came to pay me a visit and to carry me up the waterway of the lagoon to his country residence. 
The approach to his mansion by the waterside was guarded by his armada, a fleet of boats, including a Chinese sampan, a Norwegian pram, and a Cape Ann dory, the last of which he obtained from the destroyer. The doctor dined me often on good Brazilian fare, that I might, as he said, sale gordo for the voyage, but he found that even on the best I fattened slowly. Fruits and vegetables and all other provisions necessary for the voyage having been taken in, on the 23rd of October I unmoored and made ready for sea. Here I encountered one of the unforgiving mellow faction in the person of the collector of customs, who charged the spray tonnage dues when she cleared, notwithstanding that she sailed with a yacht license and should have been exempt from port charges. Our consul reminded the collector of this, and of the fact, without much diplomacy, I thought, that it was I who bought the destroyer to Brazil. Oh, yes, said the bland collector. We remember it very well, for it was now, in a small way, his turn. Mr. Lundgren, a merchant, to help me out of the trifling difficulty, offered to freight the spray with a cargo of gunpowder for Bahia, which would have put me in funds. And when the insurance companies refused to take the risk on cargo shipped on a vessel manned by a crew of only one, he offered to ship it without insurance, taking all the risk himself. This was perhaps paying me a greater compliment than I deserved. The reason why I did not accept the business was that in so doing I found that I should vitiate my yacht license and run into more expense for harbour dues around the world than the freight would amount to. Instead of all this, another old merchant friend came to my assistance, advancing the cash direct. While at Pernambuco, I shortened the boom which had been broken off when off the coast of Morocco, by removing the broken piece, which took about four feet off the inboard end. I also refitted the jaws. On October 24, 1895, a fine day even as days go in Brazil, the spray sailed having had abundant good cheer. Making about 100 miles a day along the coast, I arrived at Rio de Janeiro November 5th, without any event worth mentioning and about noon cast anchor near Villa Ganon to await the official port visit. On the following day I bestirred myself to meet the highest lord of the admiralty and the ministers to inquire concerning the matter of wages due me from the beloved destroyer. The high official I met said, Captain, so far as we are concerned, you may have the ship, and if you are to accept her, we will send an officer to show you where she is. I knew well enough where she was at that moment. The top of her smokestack being awash in Bahia, it was more than likely that she rested on the bottom there. I thanked the kind officer, but declined his offer. The spray, with a number of old shipmasters on board, sailed about the harbour of Rio the day before she put to sea. As I had decided to give the spray a yule rig for the tempestuous waters of Patagonia, I here placed on the stern a semicircular brace to support a jigger mast. These old captains inspected the spray's rigging, and each one contributed something to her outfit. Captain Jones, who had acted as my interpreter at Rio, gave her an anchor, and one of the steamers gave her a cable to match it. She never dragged Jones's anchor once on the voyage, and the cable not only took the strain on a lee shore, but when towed off Cape Horn, helped break combing seas astern that threatened to board her. End of chapter 5 Recording by Alan Chant in Tunbridge, Kent, England. www.sevenoaksprep.kent.sch.uk